In at number 5 we have Space Mountain. There are a surprising amount of urban legends surrounding this ride at Disney World which is odd, it is just a ride after all right? Nothing strange about it. According to legend one rider was decapitated while on Space Mountain because he supposedly stood up while riding. An idiot. Now this is only a little bit true, there was a decapitation but it was on a test dummy, not a real person. No person has ever been killed while riding Space Mountain. However there is another dark legend that surrounds this ride. According to legend on Space Mountain you can find Mr. One Way. Some accounts describe Mr. One Way as a red haired man with a red face, with stories stating that he hangs out in the line for Space Mountain. But this differs depending on who you ask, according to video footage Mr. One Way will sometimes get onto the ride with other passengers, grabbing an available seat. However, it is said that he disappears right before you reach the final tunnel at the end of the ride. On top of that, there is supposedly a second ghost called Disco Debbie, who is also said to haunt Space Mountain, and according to some riders, she glows in the dark. Very freaky indeed. Coming in at number 4 we have Magnolia Creek Lake. Magnolia was once a thriving riverport town in southern Wakula County, Florida which was established all the way back in the 1820s and is now classified as an extinct city by the state library and archives of Florida. All that remains of the city is a cemetery with the last known burial being back in 1859. Magnolia Creek Lane is a narrow road fit for one car at a time south of Montverde on the west side of Lake Apopka. According to legend the road and surrounding Lake is haunted by around 200 passengers who were killed in a train wreck. However, many have attempted to find evidence of this, but none has ever been found, yet the legend continues. Now while the road appears to be built on an old train track, the only documented railroad ran slightly north of the location. Now this road is supposedly where all kinds of horrible things happened back in the 1890s and according to some locals at the creek that runs to Lake Apopka, you can hear the loud screams in the woods, however when you get closer they move farther away. The scream are said to be that of the train crew that died. However, skeptics believe this is actually sound that is being reflected from another place. According to a local, Michelle, she said, I quote, My cousin went to Montverde Academy and heard about this road that runs off 455 that used to be a railroad bed. And they say that if you go down there at night, you can hear ghostly sounds and see eerie shadows of people walking on the road. I don't know for sure about this because I never went there, so it is just what I heard. Coming in at number 3, I4 Dead Zone. Interstate 4 is a highway in Florida that spans 132 miles with it running from Tampa all the way to Daytona Beach. Now the interstate is frequented daily by folks heading to work and those on their way to Disney World. Now while it is a popular highway it is also another nickname for it, the dead zone, an area where folks need to be particularly careful. This area of the highway has been the location of many accidents, electronic malfunctions as well as supposed ghost sightings. So why exactly is this spot so dangerous and filled with so much paranormal activity. Well this is because this quarter mile of highway was built over a gravesite, and as we know from movies, a disturbed gravesite means bad news bears, it means you're in for a nasty surprise, it means you're gonna die. Don't believe it? Well oddly enough on the very first day the new interstate was opened, a tractor trailer carrying frozen goods lost control and crashed directly above the disturbed graves of people who had died from yellow fever. It is believed that around 1500 to 2000 accidents have occurred on the highway since 1960 which is a lot. And worse still, many of those accidents resulted in death and between a 24 month period there were around 44 car accidents resulting in approximately 65 people being injured. Some locals fear this area of the highway so much that they actually take a much longer route around it. On top of all of this, back in the 1950s a young boy was said to have disturbed the graves and the following night he was killed by a drunk driver. And to add insult to injury, the driver was never caught. Coming in at number 2 we have the Devil's Chair, also known as the Haunted Chair. This is an urban legend hailing from folklore that is attached to a class of funerary or memorial sculpture common throughout the United States during the 19th century. Now these chairs were known as the mourning chairs for visitors to cemeteries to sit on when visiting loved ones. However since then cemeteries have provided benches for similar purposes. Once the original purpose of these chairs fell out of fashion, superstition quickly developed in association with sitting in the chair. For example, some young people dare one another to
to visit the site, most often after dark or at midnight, or in some cases on Halloween. Stories state that if you sit in the chair at these specific times, something awful will happen, with people fearing that they will be punished. In Florida specifically, the Devil's Chair is located in Casadega, Florida, and is a graveside bench in the cemetery that borders Casadega as well as Lake Helen. According to legend, an unopened can of beer left on the chair will be empty by morning. Now, in some stories, the can has already been opened, and in others, the liquid is simply gone through the unopened top. On top of that, it is said that the devil will sometimes appear to anyone bold enough to sit in the chair itself. So, if you do decide to visit the chair at night and take a seat expecting to meet the devil, just be sure to have a beer in hand ready for him because it is said that he will be expecting one, as am I, all the time. I would like a beer. Maybe that's why I'm evil. I'm the devil. And finally, coming in at number one, Legend of the Skunk Ape. Also known as the Swamp Cabbage Man, Swamp Ape, Stink Ape, Florida Bigfoot, and Louisiana Bigfoot, this is a creature that is said to inhabit Florida and is named for its appearance and for its unpleasant odor that is said to accompany it. The ape has supposedly been a part of Florida folklore since the settler period, which is absolutely insane. One of the first reports of the skunk ape in Florida came from the year 1818, when a report spoke of a man sized monkey or ape raiding stores and stores. Fishermen. This became particularly common in the 60s and 70s, with one sighting occurring in 1974, which spoke of a large, foul smelling, hairy ape like creature, which was said to run upright on two legs in the neighborhood of Dade County, Florida. However, some people were skeptical, including investigator Joe Nickel, who stated that these reports may represent a black bear and that other sightings may in fact be hoaxes or misidentification of wildlife. In terms of appearance, the creature is said to resemble the Sasquatch of the Pacific Northwest. However, the skunk Cape is said to be shorter in comparison, has long patches of fur on the shoulders and arm, and is often described as a mottled, rusty red colour, as opposed to the Sasquatch's brown and black coat. In at number five, we have Empire State Building Bermuda Triangle. We've all heard about the Bermuda Triangle. Also known as the Devil's Triangle, it is loosely defined as being a region in the western part of the North Atlantic Ocean. A number of aircraft and ships are said to have disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Since then, planes change their flight patterns to avoid the triangle. Others avoid going anywhere near it altogether. But did you know New York has its own version of the Bermuda Triangle? It is located in Midtown, more specifically a large radius around the Empire State Building. Starting in 2008, drivers started to complain about the five block radius around the Empire State. Their cars would inexplicably die and refuse to start up again. It was almost every day, says Ronnie Yakubovich, manager of NYC Tire and Auto Care. He went on to to explain that he would pick up the cars and tow them outside of the radius and they would suddenly start to work as normal. His best guess is that the radio signals from the broadcast beacon on the tower were disabling alarm systems in cars and preventing them from starting. But if that was so, why did this only start in 2008? The Empire State Building was opened in 1931, so why did this start so recently? I guess we will never know what is causing the phenomenon, maybe just avoid the area if you can. In at number 4, Super Brats of Hurricane Sandy. One New Yorker told the story of him and his roommates. They had lived peacefully in a fifth floor loft for years with barely a cockroach invading the space. Then, the winter after Hurricane Sandy, the noises began, scratching and scurrying. I walked into the kitchen one day and saw a rat the size of a small cat crawling across our food shelves, Kevin says. Traps and an exterminator proved ineffective. It was baffling that the rats would find their way to the fifth floor. Then, the roommates read reports about rats fleeing inland from flooded subway tunnels after Hurricane Sandy. Sandy. A theory was going around that the weaker rats were wiped out and the surviving rodents bred a new generation of tougher, meaner super rats. There are reports of super rats even today. Some businesses demand that the city steps in and does something as outside dining became more normal within the last year. The diners were being harassed by the giant rats. Many diners have had to leave due to the dangerous nature of the giant animals. They claimed the rats were getting increasingly hungry with the lack of tourism, leaving them with less to feed off on the streets. The city continues to claim that these super rats do not exist despite the number of sightings and photos of the giant rodents. Many live in fear that the rats might make their way into the apartments as they are harder to kill than the usual infestation. In at number 3 we have Cropsy. In the mid 90s, Ariel Abramowitz went to camp across from the notorious disused mental institution Willowbrook in Staten Island. She recalls counselors taking campers to an old building on the site, with something like blood smeared on the walls. They 
spooks them with tales of a boogeyman named Cropsy. Allegedly, he was a respected community member. He has a family and a child who he loved. One summer, he sent his child to the local camp. His son was later confirmed to have died at the camp. This sent the man mad. He disappeared from his life. No one knew where he had gone, but before he left, he vowed to get revenge on the other kids and campers. He was later found and taken to a mental hospital. The next time we would hear of him, he was described as a homicidal madman, an escaped mental patient with a hook for a hand who hunted children and dragged them back to the tunnel system that lay under the abandoned ruins of the old Seaview Hospital, a former tuberculosis sanitarium. Soon the urban legend would be unmasked as Andre Rand. Rand worked as a janitor at the Willowbrook State School on Staten Island, a place whose name alone has the power to frighten adults and children alike. The institution, built as a respite for children with intellectual disabilities, was revealed to be a living hell in the 1970s, although authorities wouldn't close the school until 1987. Rand had a long rap sheet of crimes against children. In 1983, he went to jail again after kidnapping a bus full of kids from the local YMCA and driving them to an airport. And though there wasn't enough physical evidence to charge him, police already suspected him in the disappearances of at least four other Staten Islanders. To this day, none of the bodies have been found. Rand's story and that of Cropsey continues to fascinate and horrify Tri-State residents to this day. Coming in at number two, we have Haunted Dakota. The Dakota building set the standard for Upper West Side apartment living, built at a time when the upper classes were only just becoming familiar with the concept of living in an apartment. It was known for having famous artists as residents and the board were very picky about who they allowed to live there. One of the most famous couples to live at the Dakota was John Lennon and his wife Yoko Ono. Years after John Lennon was shot dead in front of his Central Park West apartment building in the Dakota, his widow Yoko Ono saw his ghost sitting at his white piano. She claims he turned to her and said, don't be afraid, I'm still with you. When he was alive, Lennon himself claimed to have spotted a figure wandering the halls of the Dakota, whom he referred to as the crying lady. Ghost. Other residents are said to have encountered the spectre of a little girl, about seven years old, smiling and laughing and greeting people in the hallways. The Dakota's original owner, Edward Clark, had an interest in the paranormal and would often host seances to communicate with the dead. The more you play with the paranormal, the more likely you are to experience paranormal activity in the future, says paranormal researcher. She believes that when people are murdered suddenly and violently, their spirits linger. In John Lennon's case, his life was cut short in his prime. He was only 40 years old. Someone like him was happy to be alive. He was working, he had a small child, he had unfinished business. It's a prime recipe for a classic haunting. And finally in at number one we have mole people. There are around 700 miles of subway tracks underneath New York City. Did you know that the large sections of the track that isn't used is home to the mole people? Thousands of homeless people and families have created a community underground. The mole people are living under popular parts of town without the people who are walking above, even knowing they are there. They travel under cover of darkness as not to be evicted from their underground homes. Ever since the Great Depression, there have been many homeless people in New York City. During the difficult period, people started using the subway tunnels as a place to live. The places where homeless people live are dangerous. Rodents and reptiles lurk through the tunnels. There are debris and other hazards in the dark. Plus, the darkness conceals criminals, and mole people are often the victims of attacks. Thieves even steal what little they have. The entrances to the subway tunnels are are easily accessible by anyone who has the desire to venture into them. There are numerous entrances throughout the city, however it is illegal to enter and going into them can result in criminal charges. Just like any place that numerous people live, the mole people form communities. Most of them look after each other, but there is also a kind of hierarchy. Most of them are very territorial over the section of the tunnels where they live. After all, it is their home. There are couples and even families that live underground. The sad part is these people risk losing their kids if authorities find out they do not have a place to live. So the families living in the subway do their best to stay concealed. People are not the only ones living in the subway tunnels under New York City though. Many animals live beneath the streets. Some of the mole people even domesticate these animals and live with them. These animals keep them company in the very isolated and lonely place they call home. The mole people do any 
anything they can to eat and obtain the things they need. It's difficult for them though. They have to wait until it's dark to emerge from their homes. If authorities see them, they risk getting in trouble. Throughout the years, the city has made efforts to clean sections of the subway tunnels. However, the task is so vast that many abandoned areas remain untouched, especially the parts of the system that are no longer in use. As the saying goes, out of sight, out of mind. Coming in at number five, we have the werewolf of defiance. During the summer of 1972, the people of defiance claimed they were being terrorized by a werewolf. On July 25th, 1972, Ted Davis, a railroad worker, noticed something strange. He saw two hairy, huge paws on the ground in front of him. Confused and likely scared, he slowly raised his eyes and saw before him a creature at least six feet tall, hunched over and holding a large wooden board. Before Ted had a moment to react, he hit Ted on the shoulder and ran away. Just a few days after Ted and his colleagues spotted the return of the unknown creature, and again in the next following day there was another report. A panic began to spur through the town and newspapers about the strange sightings. With all the sightings, it was agreed that the werewolf was large and humanoid. There were enough reports that the Defiance Ohio Police Department had to open an investigation into werewolves in the area. It is even reported in the various newspapers in Ohio. Eventually, after days of looking with no result, the case was closed. Many people thought it was a prank, but during this experience, people were actually afraid that there were either a creature or some individual dressing up and attacking people. The sightings always happened at night, generally by the train tracks. A couple of women said it would try to get into their houses by rattling the doorknobs. The animal was said to be huge, hairy, and dressed in rags. In at number four, we have Moonville Tunnel. Located in southern Ohio, these haunted tunnels were once used for multiple railroads. The abandoned coal mining town town of Moonville near southeastern Ohio was founded in 1856. At its peak, the town was home to about 100 miners and their families. Little remains of the abandoned coal mining town of Moonville except for a few foundations, a nearby cemetery and an old railroad tunnel. Due to deterioration, the majority of the tunnels were abandoned, with some filled in for safety reasons. Now only a few remain open, one of which is famously known for being haunted. The railroads were the only route to Moonville but throughout the years many people have died near the tunnel and train tracks. This is due to the fact that the tunnels were so narrow it was not possible for pedestrians to walk alongside the tracks in the tunnel while a train was passing through, which resulted in numerous fatalities. It is said that the Moonville Tunnel is haunted by ghosts of locals who died from being struck by passing trains. Legend has it the ghost of a man who was killed instantly by a train passing through the tunnel wanders along the track bed near the old tunnel at night. One of the most famous deaths at the tunnel comes comes from a brakeman worker. Around 1859, a brakeman for the railway fell asleep, and sometime during the night, he was awakened by the sound of his train leaving the depot. He arose, stumbling onto the train track and falling beneath the wheels of the train. The brakeman never recovered from his injuries, and the ghost of the man is said to be stumbling down the tracks within the tunnel with a lantern in hand, still trying to catch the train before it leaves Moonville Station. This is why most who claim to have sighted the ghost of Moonville Tunnel say that he carries a lantern and is sometimes seen as a hovering orb of light. In at number three, we have Melon Heads. Melon Heads is the name given to the urban legend of human like beings that live in the forests of Michigan, Connecticut, and Ohio. The Melon Heads were originally abandoned children that a scientist by the name of Dr. Crow decided to take care of at his facility in Kirtland, Ohio. While the children stayed at the facility, Dr. Crow performed experiments. What got them the name Melon Heads was when Dr. Crow injected chemicals into their brains, which caused their cranium to grow abnormally large. Because of the abnormal growth, they developed hydrocephalus, which caused them to become mentally ill. After years of neglect, the melon heads ended Dr. Crow's life and burned down his facility. After the death of the mad scientist Dr. Crow, the melon heads decided to inhabit the forest of Crybaby Bridge. To survive, the melon heads feast on any animals that they hunted down. Because of their paranoia of society, the melon heads ate anyone that spotted them. To keep the melon heads cult going, they've kept inbreeding, making the offspring even more racist and paranoid. Legend holds that the melon heads reside in Wisner Road in Kirtland and Chardon Township, with locals and bypassers reported seeing and hearing the melon heads as they lurk in the forest looking for their next victim. Local lore depicts them as a territorial and angry, responsible for attacks, kidnappings, and theft of pets and livestock for food. An explorer even wrote a book about the first person encounter with melon head. Kelly Topradosian claims that she was exploring the grounds of the then abandoned Felt Mansion and her friends one night when she saw a small human in the distance. They had an unusually large head, but she 
wasn't scared. Then he started walking towards them. In at number two, we have Myrtle Hill Cemetery. Residing in Cleveland, Ohio, the Myrtle Hill Cemetery is one mysterious and scary resting place. This legend starts with a three foot round granite memorial that pays homage to a witch by the name of Stoskopf. Local legends explain that old lady Stoskopf murdered her family and tossed them in a well. When the townsfolk discovered the grisly truth, they sentenced her to death. When she was buried, she was buried standing up, and a massive grain stone was placed above her to weigh her spirit down. Though that being said, the legend was likely inspired by the real life slayings carried out by Martha Wise. Martha poisoned her family's water supply and ultimately killed three family members, only a mere mile away from where the witch's ball stands today. Early on, Wise claimed the devil made her do it, with the plain dealer reporting more than 125 witnesses were called to testify to Wise's insanity, stating that sometimes she barked like a dog and frothed at the mouth, that she wandered the woods at night and caught several barns on fire. Wise served most of the rest of her life in Marysville Reformatory, where she died at 89 in 1971. Although she's buried in Marysville, her victims are all buried within a couple of hundred feet of the Stoskopf Spherical Monuments, which wasn't installed, according to local residents, until at least the early 1940s. Locals say that if you touch the stone at night and it's warm, it means that the witch has escaped and she's on the hunt for her next victim. Many can't help but believe that the cemetery itself is haunted, and out of curiosity, many people visit the cemetery and trespass at night to try to interact with its resident spirits. And finally, in at number one, we have Rogue's Hollow. From the tales of a haunted mill and a cryberry bee bridge to a shaking graveyard and a headless horseman, Rogue's Hollow is known to be one of Ohio's most haunted areas. You can explore the park today, just be sure to stay away after dark, as that's when the ghosts come out to play. Ohio Rogue's Hollow was once a populated mining village, but very few remnants of the coal mining town remain now. The town was actually once a place notorious for outlaws and gangsters to hide out. Shootouts and robberies were common here, and these continued until the early 20th century. In spite of the town's crooked reality and a peculiar tale, creepy things continue to happen here. There have been multiple reports of sounds of a crying baby at night, shaking grounds at a graveyard, and ghost sightings that haunt the abandoned town. The abandoned mines around Rogue's Hollow are full of ghosts of miners who perish there in cave-ins and accidents, with reports of tools being picked up by unseen hands in the black shafts chipping away at veins of coal. Though the entrance to the mine has been permanently blocked, and the walkway near the mine shafts are equally plagued by residents of the spirit world. One old legend that haunts the town is of the Chidester Mill ghost. The ghost was believed to belong to a mill worker who fell into the wheel and was crushed beneath the churning waves. The ghost guarded the area and is filled with jealousy and spite. Because of the negative energy this ghost brings, he supposedly started a fire in the Chidester house when an outsider expressed interest in purchasing it. A more modern legend is the Crybaby Bridge. At the bottom of the hollow, a bridge crosses Silver Creek. According to legend, a car traveling across the bridge slid on ice and plunged into the creek. Its occupants were no longer alive. Today, you can hear the cries being heard from the surrounding woods. There are an endless amount of ghost stories circulating about the old mining town of Rogue's Hollow, with eyewitnesses reported seeing women in frontier dresses, hearing old trains, crying and floating tools, leaving us even more certain in the belief of ghosts and spirits.